I'm a South African. I'm from Johannesburg, originally born and bred. Um, however, I did my secondary schooling as well as my university, tertiary education in the, university, at, uh, at the, in, in, in the UK. Um, went over to the UK from Standard 6, did my matric equivalent over there, which is the ordinary and advanced level, and then uh, the university, tertiary education at the University of London. Uh, this was between the years of 1969 to 1977 and came back in 1977, uh, back home. Looking for a job at the time with the Soweto riots, which we were oblivious to at the time, not politically orientated. Um, looking for a job, no experience, so in a catch-22 situation, they wanted people with experience. Coming into a country where obviously the black-white situation is quite serious. But nevertheless, this is home, so we came back again. Um, got a break with the City Council of Johannesburg in 1978. I was at the City Council of Johannesburg for nearly 20 years. So I was given an opportunity by uh, then CKR, they were called Sean Kirtland at the time, and uh, they're now called CKR, an established consulting practice. Um, 1997 is when I joined them. Got a shareholding eventually with them, uh, still have, and in 2001 established a, an empowerment electrical consultancy called Nala Consulting. So we've been going for 10, 11 years on our own, but before that, as I say, I was with CKR um, for five, six years, whatever it was. So I've been in the industry in total for about 32 odd years. We're going to cover base information, um, i.e. the township layouts, etc. Um, the township layouts themselves, the types, the usage within the layouts. Then, how do we get the job done? Um, we've got to liaise with the local authority, and therein, that's a topic all on its own. Um, after that, I think we'll touch on the, the budget situation and the design development as well as the tender processing, specification, etc. So it, it's a broad spectrum of what is involved in getting a township reticulation done from start basically to finish. All right, this uh, concept is not unique in South Africa, I don't believe, in broad terms. It's a well-established um, process, if you like, elsewhere uh, in, in the continent as well as in established countries in Europe. Obviously, every, every country is different, has its unique needs and its situations. So you've got to adapt to them. But by and large, in broad terms, um, what we're going to discuss here uh, applied to, to, to basically any township development anyway. You've got certain differences like voltage supplies, etc., etc., but those are specifics. In broad terms, generally about the same. Okay, um, number one, base information. What do, what do we mean by that? Firstly, um, the township developer, how do you actually get involved? I think it's important that we touch on that. Um, where do you fit in, in terms of township development? What basically happens is a Mr. Moneybags comes along as a township developer, looking to develop a township, there's money in property and so on. And he decides, okay, I want to develop this for a certain use. It may be residential, it may be commercial, it may be industrial. Commercial meaning offices, etc. Industrial meaning factories um, in a heavy industry, that sort of thing. So he looks at a piece of ground and he decides the location's right for me, the price is right for me, and I want to develop here. Because the market, he's tested the market out and it looks right for him to develop and to, 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 to sell on. What does he need to do to develop? Well, he needs to get a township layout plan. Now, typically, he would need assistance from the likes of a, a town planner, as well as an architect, but generally a town planner to start off with. Because what he does is he cuts up the township um, in terms of optimum earth sizes, earth meaning a stand. Okay? Stand is the piece of property with defined boundaries. Those urban, uh, which is a plural of earth, 
could ha could be a freehold stand. What do we mean by that? Freehold stand essentially is a stand which has full title. So if you go and buy a piece of ground uh, and you want to build a house on it, you will get title to to that particular stand. You have the alternative whereby you have township uh, townships that have been developed whereby they're not freehold. They actually fall under leasehold category. What they mean by that, then the town planners can describe this a lot uh, better than I can. But essentially what that means is that it's not free title. It's not a title to yourself. So that's the other important thing that needs to be taken into co uh, consideration. What about the use of the stands? You've got various types of use, as I've mentioned earlier. Residential. Residential, you could have a house on a stand. That generally is termed residential one. And this is all town planning jargon. Residential three is another category. What is that? That is townhouse complexes where they flats, um, you know, high density blocks of flats, but individual units within those flats. Um, you could have the commercial category. Commercial essentially is the office type uh, category. Industrial, that's self-explanatory. And there's various others, but those are the major ones. So if you look at a township layout, typically, um, you would have a mixture of those if it's a fairly big development. The next thing to consider is that township or the, the proposed township that the developer is looking at. Is it a proclaimed piece of ground? Meaning, is it an approved township? Has it been applied for previously? Has somebody else gone through the mill where it's been cut up and it's an approved piece of ground where the supply utilities are well aware of the piece of ground and they've allocated service to it or, or services to it or they've planned to allocate services to it? Or, if that hasn't happened, then generally what the pieces of ground that he's looking at would fall under would be agricultural. Farm portions. So it's one pit to add the farm portion in those days. Farming on it, it hasn't been developed and he's just farming on it. Now it becomes a formal township. If you want to get into a formal township situation, you've got to go through this process. Servicing the township. The electrical guys obviously look at the electrical side. But you must not forget that part of the servicing, it's a civil service as well. Civil services meaning stormwater, water, sewer are the main ones. There may be one or two others. Um, so what we are going to discuss in this program essentially has to be replicated for the respective civil services or the wet services. Okay. Once that has been done uh, and the use has been tied down by the developer as to what he wants, we as electrical consultants really get involved at that stage. They give us a layout of the township to say, right, there it is, that's what we want to service. There's a usage, that's the size of the stand. Please tell me, A, what I need in terms of bulk services, and B, what I need in terms of servicing the individual stands. So base information would essentially cover those topics. Here's a typical township, just to illustrate the point um, of, of what I'm actually talking about. If you look at this particular township um, out in the Hammond's Crawl area, the township boundary basically is along, along those lines. If you carefully study this, um, you'll see that you've got roughly 600 odd stands, urban, of which the majority are these individual types. The individual types are in this particular case, res one. So that's your conventional suburban house stand type arrangement. Looking at it closely, um, what you also have up here, you've got res residential three, residential three over there, over there, and you've got another one over there. These essentially, essentially are big stands, and you will end up with block of flats type of units, multiple dwellings but it's all on one earth. From a servicing perspective, the utilities will stipulate to you one earth, one connection. That's the ruling that they work to. So you come along to a stand like this, uh, and we'll look at the, the detail of the design shortly. That particular stand, 431 for argument's sake, will need a connection 
to that stand. So that's what the design has to allow for. If you look at the bigger one, which is res 3, a connection, a single connection to that stand, but then the developer or whoever the owner of that stand is arranges to reticulate internally. So the utility says, I'm responsible up to the boundary of the, of the earth. Beyond that point, it's internal. Somebody else takes responsibility. So that is basically the principles under which they work. One connection per earth, and anything beyond that is your, your responsibility or the owner of the stand. Interestingly, on here, you'll notice that you've got other types, or other uses, which I haven't mentioned. Private open space is generally a park area. Sometimes, or more often than not, the bigger townships have got what they call public open spaces, and those are the parks that the council looks after. Where it's private, the developer or whoever owns that piece of ground is responsible for that. You've got another one over here. Here in this corner, you've got one educational. What is educational? It's a site for a school. Okay. Then, very important with this type of mix is that you've got a lot of residential stuff. You've got people living there. How do they get serviced in terms of shops and things? What they do is they, in this particular case, quite rightly, they've put in a business stand, which is a fairly big earth. Again, one connection, because it's one earth, and the reticulation gets done internally. Site for a huge shopping, shopping centre. And that position of that, and this is what the town planners have come up with to mess, best make the thing work from a commercial sense, is that it would also serve as adjoining areas. So it's not just for the property. So they look at not just the piece of ground that they want to develop in terms of a township. They look to see how it fits in with the surrounds as well. And the council has various town planning schemes by which you've got to abide by. You can't just come in here and say, all right, I've got residential urban along here. I want to build a set of factories over there because that's what works for me. No, no. You have to find out who the licensed authority is from an electrical perspective. What do we mean by that? We've got, in this country, which I think is probably unique uh, from a, a supply authority point of view, we've got ESCOM, who's the major or the biggest supply authority in, in the country. And then we've got the little municipalities or the city councils that have the licensed uh, license for supplying any given township. It's all determined by, um, by licenses that have been given, th uh, given through by the regulator and so on. So you've got to establish as the consultant whose, whose jurisdiction does it fall under. Is it ESCOM or is it the city council? Your task as the consultant, you had to go and find out two things. Firstly, have you got capacity available for the area? Mr. Supply Authority. Let's say it's ESCOM in this case. Um, they would check their records to see whether they, in terms of the existing network infrastructure, whether they've got capacity in which you could tap into from a bulk perspective, uh, or whether the capacity is not there. If it's not, Mr. Supply Authority, please tell me what is involved in giving us a supply, making it available. When you say making it available, you need to come to the boundary of the township. They say, up to that point, I need XMVA or XKVA to service the township. So they've got to look and tell you. Now that becomes a bit of an arduous process as it is now because there's a lot of investigation that needs to be done. Today it's quite difficult because of scarcity of power. There's capacity not lying available and it actually stifles a lot of development. However, let's, in this particular case, um, it was half and half in that the capacity was there, but it wasn't readily available. They had to do, in this case, S, in this case ESCOM, had to do some upgrade on the upstream infrastructure to make the supply available. And the upgrade work was quite extensive. And being extensive work, it means it's going to cost a lot. Uh, a lot. Extensive work also means time, because that's the other question you need to ask. Mr. Supply Authority, uh, my client, the developer, is planning to develop and service these stands within a year, 18 months. Can you meet that time frame? And that, of course, has to tie in with the developer's program. 
that he can provide the, 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 the supply within that time frame. If not, obviously it pushes things out. Pushes things out means more costs, etc. So everything's about timing, availability and cost. On the residential side, the individual res one Irvin, it's we've got reasonable standards and norms as to what these Irvin would take in terms of, of power. It's starting to change now because of everybody becoming, and quite rightly so, energy conscious. So what you used to put in in the old days in terms of appliances and what you needed for power, etc. Three geysers to a house, for example, was fairly common. That's now cutting, being cut down drastically because of the cost of energy. Um, so those norms are, are starting to change and, and the way those norms were established was through experience by and large. There are statistical and mathematical ways of calculating these things, but generally you find that uh, if you've got a similar township like the one you're looking at, you can look at the historical records, see what they're drawing, and it gives you a very good indication as to what this township will need. And you do a similar assessment based on the Res 3, which is the block of flats, or the dense uh, multi-dwelling units, as well as the business. How do you do that? You look at the size of the earth, and you apply a certain KVA based on the size of that earth, plus what the town planners call an FAR, a floor air ratio. That floor air ratio is, in very simple terms, is what the coverage of the stand is going to be. Okay? You can't just take a stand and say, right, I'm going to build on the whole thing and that's it. It doesn't work that way. You've got to leave certain spaces to tie in with the surroundings and to make it reasonable. So, based on those factors, you work out a KVA. For example, in this particular case, um, we'll take the REST3 and the educational as, a, as an example. The REST3, we've got 128 units that have been allocated to this piece of ground. That's the density that the town planner and the developer has proposed, which ties in with what the city council wants. The type of development that's going to likely to happen in an area like this would be, we would allocate roughly three and a half kVA per unit, dwelling unit. So if you do the calculation, as a connection, as I mentioned previously, this is going to need a bulk connection from the utility. We've worked at 128 units at three and a half kVA, 448 kVA. So, City Council, you need to give us 448 kVA to that earth. Okay. We didn't look at the FAR here, the F floor area ratio, because that was determined by the density. It came out in the wash. Educational, here the FAR comes in. We've got a piece of ground, 3.44 hectares. Hectare is about 10,000 square meters. That's the full extent of the earth. FAR of 0.4 which is, as I said, it relates to the coverage. And then we've got 7 kVA or 7 VA per 100, uh, 7 over 100, which is a factor that we've got to apply to give us the calculation for the amount of power we're going to need. So in this particular stand, it works out to 963 kVA. So when we've gone through this exercise through all the various urban, and we know, I can tell you that for one of these urban, we probably need about 4 kVA or 5 kVA, depending on the type of unit that the, the developer is going to develop. You add all of this up and you apply a diversity factor because not everything is going to happen at the same time. You'll have your peaks and troughs and so on and it averages itself out. That is the figure that the electrical consultant needs to come up with to go to the supply utility, in this case ESCOM, to say, I've done my calculation, Mr. ESCOM, here it is, this is what I'm going to need to service this township. And he now, generally they also have a good look at it and say, look man, either you've, you're out or maybe you, you, you're a little bit conservative, you need to be along there because that's what our experience is, is what you should actually apply for here. So you agreed as to what capacity you're going to need. Okay. In this particular case, the area is serviced through a 11,000 volt system through ESCOM. And it would, what, what we had agreed with ESCOM is from the, from the Hammond Scroll uh, substation, which had to be a newly built substation in the vicinity, to provide 11 kV cables, 11,000 volt cables to the township. And we would then design 
how the ring main would snake through the township to best service the township. Now, herein lies a, a, a key element. When you design the township, when you do your layout now, given the township layout, you're doing your electrical layout now, you start off with the medium voltage system. You've got to do an optimum scheme. You, you can't just go in and say, right, I'm going to put a cable in there and I'll service this stand this way and that stand that. There's a lot of thought that goes into this and it's an iterative process. You'll never get it right the first time. It'll, you'll do it the first time and say, oh, hang on, it works this way, but it doesn't work for the other way. If it's not optimum, then it's adding to the costs. When you're adding to the costs, which means that if you go and buy that piece of ground, guess where that cost is going to be lumbered in that piece of ground, okay, or that unit that you're going to buy. So the layout has got to be optimum. The types and the size of cables that you use have to be optimum as well. You can't over-design or under-design. You've got to be optimum. At the same time, I mentioned that these streets, if they freehold, they generally get handed over to the city council. So that's the point I was going to make early on. Because it's going to be the whole scheme, the whole township, in fact, is going to be handed over to the city council. They've got a vested interest in making sure that you do things to their standards and norms and you do things properly. So that once you as the private consulting engineer has done the work and handed it over to them. And they don't want to be lumbered with a problem or a set of problems. And that's why they have a keen and vested interest. And what we generally do is, with all our schemes, the designs that we do, pass it through to them, not necessarily for, for approval, but for vetting. But where it's handed over, generally they've got to approve it as well because they're taking it over. All right, the, the medium voltage system, just briefly, in this particular layout, what, what does it look like from a schematic perspective? If you look at the, the legend here, that legend gives you the various elements that have gone into servicing the township from an 11 kV perspective. Very briefly, what we're looking at is, uh, we'll go through this briefly on the individual layouts. We've got miniature substations, in the, we've got 70 square millimeter 11 kV cables. We've got one square, 120 square millimeter LV cables, house connections. There are some ring main units, which are switching points. We've got street lighting. We've got street lighting. We've got LV distribution boxes, and we've got we've got sleeves. How do they get? How do they get fitted into the township? I'll show you just now. But let's just look at the 11 kV system. From the Hummel Scroll substation, which I showed you earlier, the proposal here to service the township was to run three cables. One, two, three. They ringed into each other to give you security of supply. Uh, so that you have, if you have a problem, let's say, on one leg, you can feed back on another leg. So your design comes into this whereby you make sure that you allow for enough capacity on the cable. Worst case here, you have a fault here. That piece of cable goes down, which means that's open and you've got to feed all the way back there, so you've got to pick up all this load. What are these things? These are the miniature substations that we will show you just now on the layout, all over there, picking these up through the 11 kV system. Um, these are similarly miniature substations, miniature substation sites. Your locations, uh, in this particular case, the council wanted location spelt out as well, so we've put them down there as well. Give an example here, you've got the mini sub that we saw. There's a pillar box over there, a distribution box over there, and this tells you that you're running a, a connection, or you're allowing for a connection to there, to there, to there, and to there, as well as to those. So basically, that distribution box looks after those houses there. So that's your low voltage, and you do that right through the township. Again, you, there's a, it's, it's an iterative process whereby that may not be the optimum position for this in the greater scheme of things. If you change something here, it has a ripple effect. Okay? There is software that available in the marketplace that can assist you with this. In the old days, we used to do this manually. Uh, but you learnt a lot. You know, it, it, gave you, it gave you a better insight as to what you were actually doing. Software does a lot of that for you these days, so it's probably the better way to go. 
So that essentially sorts out the individual connections to each earth. Then we have to provide other services to the township. Other services meaning street lighting, because that's a stipulation as well from the council. The developer shall provide street lighting. Street lighting must conform to the council standards because they take over the streets. So what you see here are the street lights that have been proposed uh, as part of the design, and you'll see that theme all the way through to the township. The poles and the cables will be to their standards as well. It's not just Telcom as a service provider. You've got others. You've got wired services. You've got wireless services. So the old way possibly of doing things is slightly antiquated now. But just to illustrate the example, we, if it was a Telcom service site and the developer decides that's the way he wants to go, then we would need to approach Telcom likewise with ESCOM to say, have you got services in the area? If not, what's involved in making them available? And what are your requirements to service the township? They would generally not service the township with their cabling at the outset. They would do so as and when the stands were developed. And this guy, for example, develops a house and he says, I need a connection. And he would approach the telecom and say, please give me the connection. Only then would they start putting the cables in. But obviously you'd say, hang on, but the streets and everything's developed. How, how are they, are they going to rip everything up again? The answer to that is no, if the thing has been planned properly. Planned properly, what do we mean by that? What we mean by that is you go to Kitalcom and you go through an exercise whereby you do a layout showing, and what you see in green here, are sleeves and manholes that you provide as part of the services installation right at the outset so that when they come along later on, they can come and pull the cables without hopefully causing as less or minimizing disruption to what is there already, not digging up the whole township again. So what you see here are manholes and sleeves. In this particular case, there are a couple of intake points from Telcom side. There's one here, one here. Those are the two. And the rest gets reticulated. They've obviously got a backbone here of sorts, whereby all the major cables are running along here and along here. You've also got to take into consideration you've got a business site coming up here. They're going to need lots and lots of telephone lines, fax lines, ADSL, etc., etc. So they've got to make sure that they've got enough capacity and that what they ask us to install in terms of sleeves, sizes, number of sleeves will take care of this. As well as the rest three, you could have, we mentioned we've got 128 units there and I don't know, 130 odd there or whatever the case is. So there's a big demand. So what we do is when we do the installation, these sleeves are there plus spare sleeves to cater for future services. And if it's done properly, then hopefully we don't dig up the road. And generally what we do is we ask the civil engineer who's putting in more services than what we are. He generally is tasked to do the coordination of services within the public, within the public streets. For example, you've got these streets along here, and I've shown you on the other the drawings where you've got various electrical cables running through. The civil guys will have a similar set of drawings layouts, designs for the stormwater layout, for the water reticulation layout, as well as the sewer layout. Now you've got to put your stuff in to fit in with theirs. All right? It's, it can get quite hairy sometimes if you don't have enough space to work with. Now all the services, very important point, all the services that we installed, the wet services as well as ours, where a township is being taken over, being handed over to the city council. All the services you will notice, I showed you on the drawings, are all within the road reserve. They're not all over the place running through the stands. Reason is, those are individually owned stands. The streets remain public. They need access to the streets for maintenance or for upgrading or whatever work they need to do. So all your services are confined within the road reserves. Now you've got that stretch to play with to install all the electrical stuff, the stormwater, the water, the sewerage, telecom, all of those things, street lighting, sleeves, manholes. So it becomes quite an art to try and now design the actual final layout to fit all of those without it being a, a big mess. There's got to be structure, there's got to be thought behind what you do because ultimately some chap has got to maintain that lot. And that's why 
another reason why the city council gets quite intimately involved in what you do before they take it over. All right, so you've done a specification, you do a tender, and you go out to tender on behalf of the township developer. But we mustn't forget the fact that there are emerging contractors coming through and they've got to be brought on board. Um, like all things from the consulting engineer side, on the design side, he's got to be mindset of or mindful of the fact that he's got to bring people along as well. We fairly established and we generally, if we were getting involved with a scheme like this, we would bring on board a, an emerging contractor, uh, a consultant, sorry so that he has an opportunity to get involved with something like this. It becomes part of the learning process and then he one day, once he's got enough experience, can also do what we do. And it's a good thing and uh, the, the mentorship is very important, becoming more and more important now. All right, so we've, gone, we've got out to tender, we've done an adjudication and we've recommended uh, to the developer, to the client, that the tender specification of contractor A meets with the specification, the budget's okay, please arrange to, to appoint. The appointment of that contract, uh, the timing of it is very important um, because he's got to be on site when the civil services are being installed. So he's got to be there. You can't say, all right, okay, you know, we'll get the civil services in, then we'll look at the electrics. The project management of this becomes very, very important. The site monitoring and inspections become very, very important. If you're clever, we spoke about costs earlier. If you're clever, you arrange with the civil, civil engineer, the designer, to work out a scheme whereby you know exactly where your services are going to go in within any given road reserve, and you fit in with him, and he does the bulk trenching for you, for you meaning for the electrical services as well. And then the site monitoring becomes important whereby all these things are put in place the way they were designed to. If they're not, they become a problem. You're going to clash, you're going to damage services, etc., etc. If that goes smoothly, then of course you've got a test, a commission, and all the handover procedures and the manuals uh, for the various bits of equipment that you're installing, you've got to have very, very important as-built information, especially in a place like this. There, the site monitoring becomes important again, where as he puts the stuff in, you might have a cable joint. That cable joint has got to be pinpointed so that it's a potential weak weakness. If, if that hasn't been done properly, it may be okay when you've tested. Two, three years down the line, it's not as strong as it should be. It's a weak point, goes up. Now you're looking to see, hang on, where was that joint done? So if your records are accurate, and you can go as far as GPSing those points, and that's what they do now. You do all of this now. We exactly where your cables are laid, where your joints are, where your equipment is. You label it properly, it relates back to a GPS or some sort of a, of a remote system. And it helps tremendously with the asphalt information. Record keeping, which helps you with your maintenance, it helps you with any fault finding, etc., etc. That tends to not have as much emphasis as perhaps the design or the installation side. Reason is people want to get finished, you know, you're running late, time is money, etc., etc. But generally, that's as important, if not more, than what you've done previously. Not, in my opinion, not enough effort is put into that. Uh, and, and the problem, I think, lies on both sides. Consult consulting engineer, developer wants to get finished, get going. Council, perhaps too busy, you know, they've got other fires to put out. And yeah, OK, we'll take it over. Where's your stuff? Here it is, and off you go. Generally leads to problems. So if you, if you pay a little bit more attention to that phase, it generally pays dividends at the end. And lastly, just on the handover, what are the warranties? You need to put that on record. From installation to testing to commissioning, what do your warranties cover in terms of time and in terms of the equipment? Very important because, as I mentioned earlier, the installation may have a bit of a problem and council's taken it over. 
within six months something fails, you know, he's got to have something to fall back on. So those warranties are generally in place for, for 12 months uh, in terms of installation as well as the equipment. Um, recently, problems coming cropping up with township development and um, that's why a lot of developers are now even more careful before they embark on such schemes is you have a scheme like this, you've got 600 odd stands. Unless all of these stands, you have some sort of a structure in place whereby the sales go well and the building process goes well and all the units, or generally all the units, get built on. You could end up with a township where it's fully serviced and there's nothing built on. And unfortunately, and this I think is unique in our country, whereby stuff that's put in the ground or above ground disappears very, very quickly. Then if you're the township developer, um, this guy's bought a piece of, piece of ground, he wants to build his, build his house. He's got full title, he's paid for everything. And he now wants to build a house and says, right, uh, Mr. Council, give me my connection. And the infrastructure has been ripped out. Who pays for the replacement of that and the time? It's a, it's a, it's a major, major problem. What does the electrical consultant take care of in terms of the reticulation budget? He has to look at the following elements. He's got to look at the bulk supply, which we mentioned early on, bulk supply to the township. If the supply is not readily available, they look at what they call a link cost, which is like a bridging link. That's another cost. A bulk service contribution cost, it's a, it's a town planner thing um, that has come in recently, recently, over the last 15 years or so, wasn't the case before. The town planner can tell you more about bulk service country, but they, those costs can be quite huge. Then you've got, of course, internal reticulation costs, and the elements, just to recap, are the medium voltage costs, reticulation costs, low voltage, street lighting, and the telecom stuff that we spoke about. Um, other costs that could come in, site monitoring. We mentioned important to make sure what goes into the ground is accurate, is to design, etc. Um, a risk sometimes is you don't know what the type of soil you've got when you're digging up, but generally they tend to sort that out up front by doing geotech, etc., to make sure you haven't got rock whereas you've allowed for soft soil. So that, that might affect costs. Builders sometimes would require temporary supplies which may not be allowed for, so you might, if they is an adjacent township where it's reticulated, you could get a connection from there. Or it's got to allow for a generator. So those costs you need to look at. Very important, because of the stop-start nature of development today, escalation. Um, you could, you know, the plan is to start today, but you finish in a year's time and it end, you end up finishing in two years' time. What happens to that extra year? Last cost, the last set of costs, to be cognizant of is once you've bought that piece of ground, that connection fee somebody's got to pay for. Sometimes a township developer works it into his scheme, but generally if it's a freehold piece of ground, he will say, right, I'll allow for services in the street. You then approach the council, apply for a connection, and you will pay for that connection. You pay a deposit against that con connection, de deposit against consumption for that connection, uh, and those basically, those cover all the costs that the electrical guy has got to take care of. Telcom side, generally, they work in a, a weird way. They, they're not upfront major costs on their side. They tend to build it into their tariffs and their rentals and so on. Uh, so generally, Telcom won't come to you and say, look, we need X million to provide a connection to this township. Exactly how that's structured, I'm not too sure. Uh, as I say, it, it's weird and wonderful. So that's as far as the budgets go. The site works. Whatever you work out in terms of your tendering process, your specification, and getting an electrical guy on board, you've got to make sure that he ties in with the main contractor's program. I mean, we said he can't work out of tandem with him. Procurement schedule of his equipment. Again, very important because 
These days we find that certain pieces of equipment have become long lead items, um, which wasn't the case perhaps a year or two ago, but due to the changes in the marketplace, certain items have become scarce. But a good consulting engineer needs to be aware of all of these things. And he factors that in. If not, he alerts the project manager and the developer to that fact. They say, look, certain pieces of equipment, he identifies them, say, long lead, it's going to affect your program, let's sit down and see how we're going to deal with it. Very important. That needs to be done right up front. Another important aspect is the surveying of the site. Now, we mentioned we're running services within the road reserve. That road reserve has to be pegged and surveyed. So you can't, you've got to make sure that you're within that, those boundary lines. If you're outside, you've got services that belong to the council running through private ground, private property, and that in itself is a huge problem. So it's very important that the surveying is checked before the installation commences. The construction monitoring we touched on, so I won't mention anymore. The quality of works, exceedingly important. Okay. Another aspect that a lot of people don't pay a lot of attention on, very, very important. The quality, meaning it, not only the equipment that's bought, make sure that factory tested, make sure that it is to spec, the deliveries, when they are done, the goods aren't damaged. When they get installed, they get installed properly as per specification. And when they're tested and commissioned, exactly the same. And then the marking and the, and the, and, and the uh, recording of the information as to where the stuff has gone in. Extremely, extremely important. Installation record. Um, on the budgets, just one point we need to add, or a couple of points there. Often when things are not what they seem on paper out on site, you will obviously end up with variation orders. Need to be monitored and administered very, very carefully because they can run away with you. A good consulting engineer would ensure that if there are any variation orders that need to be put in place, then he gets the necessary approvals up front or before the contractor does his installation so that there's close and very, very good control on the finances. We mentioned this could run away it's very, very quickly if you're not careful. So the financial monitoring and control is very, very important. The processing of payment certificates to contractors, a good consulting engineer would make sure those are done properly as well. Because at the end of the day, once that's been certified, you've actually said to the contractor and to the client, okay, I'm happy that this amount of work's been done to specification, and uh, the amount claim is, is, is in order, and I'm happy that you do that. Um, if you don't monitor that and have a good handle on that, you're asking for trouble. Related to that, of course, at the end of the job is the final account. And you make sure that all your ducks in a, are in a row. And how do you do that? Good record keeping, good monitoring, good supervision, and constant liaison with the contractor. Um, it's often a, 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 th a thought that contractors are there to rip you off. Not, not, no, not generally the case. Um, there are good contractors and hopefully the contractor you've got on board is a good guy. So, you know, you have a good working relationship with him. You must have. You don't want a contractor who's going to give you hassles along the way and you're not going to, go, you're not going to work well uh, because that will be reflected in the end product, the job that gets done, which you don't want. And... To end off on this particular item, the asbolt information, which you spoke about, um, included in the asbolt information, handover manuals, are all the test certificates, very important, which we didn't mention before. All the manuals, uh, how does the equipment operate, when does it need to get maintained, how often, how, by whom, etc., etc. If you don't f do that, then the equipment's not going to get maintained. And it's not going to reach its design life. It's going to be abused and so on and so forth. It's going to lead to breakdown and so on. So you don't want that. And uh, yeah, you make sure you've done, you followed all these steps properly. Generally, you shouldn't have a problem. The situation in the country generally, and this is really broad brush, is we, we, we don't have enough power. And I think that's everybody knows that. 
However, there are steps that have been taken to supplement the power that we need uh, in terms of generating capacity. That is, the two power stations, huge power stations that are going up, Kusile and, uh, and the other one off the Botswana coast, I forget, Madupe, sorry. That's on the generating side. The ESCOM has also got various other generating, uh, power generating initiatives on the go. They've also gone to private enterprises to see if they can't generate power which they could push into the grid. So yes, those initiatives are starting to roll. Unfortunately, they take time. And uh, until we get those on stream, we're sitting with a problem. Uh, the impact of that, the impact of that is, in my opinion, two of twofold. The one is it's killing a lot of schemes uh, simply because there is no power capacity. So a potential developer who comes along and says, look, I've got the money, I've got the finances, the market is crying out for certain types of development, which I can provide, uh, but I, I don't have services. Um, kills it, kills it. The other problem, challenge, is uh, dealing with officials at ESCOM and the utilities. Unfortunately, uh, for the, the reasons that we mentioned earlier, um, the skills are unfortunately no longer there. The experience is no longer there. Uh, and that needs to be built up again. Again, like the power generation, that's going to take time to get in. Uh, the skills will take time to develop. And I think it responsibility lies on the likes of us to, to, to some extent to, to bring up the new guys. But the will and the capacity has to be there. The people who are getting into this kind of industry from a supply authority point of view must want to get involved, must want to get their hands dirty, and must want to learn. Now, it's not a quick fix. It took us from the older generation a good 10, 15 years of, of slogging. It was slogging of learning the hard way, um, learning through experience, learning through making mistakes, and learning through other people who have got experience. It's the need and the feasibility, timing. If you get those three matched, you've got a project. So it'll, it, that'll always happen, that'll always be there. Unless suddenly the population declines and uh, there's no need to build anymore.